Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Welcome back to week three of our series titled Celebrate Life, where we are talking all about living in the life that God has won and given to us. The Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. We fully believe here that Jesus has given us that life. But sometimes we have hurts, we have hang-ups, and we have habits that might seem to hide us or shield us from that life that Jesus has won for us. And to illustrate a quick idea today, I want to show you a quick video on the wall here behind me. So does anybody know the name of that process we just watched? It starts with an R. Restoration. Say that with me. Say restoration. And first of all, if you ever have something to do, like you have something that needs to get done, and you see one of those restoration videos pop up, do not click it. Do not click it. YouTube has this evil thing known as an algorithm. What the algorithm does is it studies every single second you're watching and clicking on something. And based upon what you've done in the past, it suggests the next thing that you want to watch. So for me, one time I was up and it was, let's say it was 10 o'clock and I was watching some sports videos. By 1 a.m., I'm watching videos of animal doctors helping calves that have broken legs. I'm like, I have work tomorrow. But I'm over here trying to be a fake animal doctor. The algorithm dragged me all the way to 1 a.m. But anyways, when it comes to these restoration videos, there is something that is so satisfying about seeing something that was created perfect, lose that status of perfection, and then be returned to its original condition. There is something that we love to see When there's a hammer that's all rusty and it's all beaten up and it's lost, let's say it's original value, it's so amazing when that hammer is placed in the hand of what I'm going to call an artist and they restore it back to its original condition. This man that was working on that hammer is clearly a restoration expert. One thing that I appreciate about these videos is that these experts, when they're restoring something, they're not trying to make it better. They're not going to coat it in epoxy, and they're not going to spray paint it pink, and they're not going to change the handle from wooden to metal. A good restorer understands all I have to do is take this object that lost its value and bring it back to the original condition. Say that with me. Say original condition. And believe it or not, as we're talking about this series, Celebrate Life, that works really closely with our program at the church known as Celebrate Recovery. What if I told you today that recovery is not about improving on God's design? What if recovery was about us being restored to our original condition? What if we don't have to try to do better than what God did in the garden? What if the whole process of recovery is about us getting back to how we were in our original condition? Listen to the definition of recovery. 
The first definition of recovery is a return to a normal state of health, mind, or strength. We recover to a normal or to an original state of health, mind, or strength. And we understand this. If somebody goes into surgery and now they're recovering from their surgery, we know that they're getting back to their original state of health. And when we look at the original condition of humanity in the garden, we see that God created everything good, including us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air of the heavens and over the livestock over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we see that God creates humanity. This is at the conclusion of all of creation. And then in verse 31, God kind of zooms out and God gives a commentary on what he's done thus far. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. It was very good. It doesn't say that it was very good, except Adam and Eve had some mental issues. No. It was very good. It doesn't say it was very good, except Adam was missing his left leg. Nope. There was no physical issues. It was very good. It doesn't say it was very good, except they were spiritually dead. No. Everything that God created was good. We need to understand one thing today, that a good God cannot create evil. God is not the author of evil circumstances. God does not cause evil to happen in this earth today. If there's something evil that happened to you, and you're saying, God, why did you do this to me? You're blaming the wrong suspect. It is Satan, it is the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus comes that we might have life. That is God that we serve. And what I love about creation in this account is that Adam and Eve are not just created good, but they're also placed in a good place. They're in a garden that is named the Garden of Eden. When you research the Garden of Eden, you see that it is a place of life. One of the words that pops up over and over again used to describe Eden is a place of fertility. So fertility is almost one step beyond life. Life means you're alive, right? Fertility means I can beget more life. So the Garden of Eden as a place of fertility is a place where life is created and it goes on and on and on and on again. It's a state of perpetual life. And this is the type of life that Jesus brings to us. So today in this message, as I'm talking about recovery, I want us to understand this very clearly, that recovery is not about trying to do better than what God already did. It's about us being restored to the condition he created us in. It's about recovery, a return to the normal state of health, mind, or strength. And we see this very clearly in the Bible. And this story that we're going to look at takes place in a place that is either known as the Gadarenes or the Gerasenes, based upon the translation that you use. Both names are valid for this region. This region is a predominantly Gentile region. Everybody say Gentile. When you're studying your Bible and you see the word Gentile, just think of a non-Jew. But not just the ethnicity, but someone that might not be familiar with the customs of Jews or the Jewish religion at the time. So when you see Gentile, just think, all right, these people are not what we would call like church people. They're kind of world people is what we would say in our modern times. And in this story, we see that there's a large herd of pigs that are located nearby, which is why it's probably a Gentile region. And we pick up our story in verse 26. It says that Jesus and his disciples sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. It says, when Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from a city who had demons. And it's not talking about your coworker. Some of you are like, I know that man. I know him. He right, he right at the front desk every week. Not, not that person, I promise. It says, for a long time he had worn no clothes. Yep, that's him. <laughs> Anyways. 
It says, he wore no clothes and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. He's living in a graveyard. It says, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and he fell down before him and he said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. So the, 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 we see it says, don't torment me, Jesus. We need to understand this is the demon speaking. This is not the man speaking saying, Jesus, don't torment me. It's the demon like, uh-oh, Houston, we got a problem. We're evil and Jesus has shown up. So when the demon recognizes Jesus, he says, please do not torment me. This man in other translations, not other translations, other accounts of this passage says that he had a legion of demons, which could potentially mean thousands of demons living on the inside of him. And this man was clearly not in his original condition. He clearly was not in his original condition like we saw in the garden. He was not in his right mind. Spiritually, he was bound by demons and the Bible says that physically this man would cut himself. That this man would cry out all night and harm himself. He was not in the original condition. This man is actually the exact opposite of what we see in the Garden of Eden. We see in the Garden of Eden that Adam, he lived in freedom. This man in the tombs, he lived in an area of bondage. We see that in the Garden of Eden that Adam had dominion over the earth. We see with this man, unfortunately, that the demons had dominion over him, that he was under their rule. We see in the Garden of Eden that it is a place of life, a place of fertility. And where is this man living? In the tombs, in a graveyard, in a place where death goes, a place where death lives, in a sense. When we look at our lives, we understand we were not designed to live among the places of death. We were designed to live in the Garden of Eden, in the place of life. So as we're talking about recovery today, let's make this personal to ourselves. Ask yourself, how many of the issues in my life are because of a negative environment I found myself in? How many of the issues in my heart are there because I found myself in a graveyard, in a dead place, connected to people that were bringing death instead of bringing life? And if you're here today and you're living in an environment of death and you feel like you're stuck and you need permission to leave, here's your permission. If you're stuck in a relationship, you're stuck connected to people that are speaking death, and bringing death, but we've been friends for so long. Yeah, but is it worth the internal death that you've been feeling? Is it worth the stress that you've been feeling? We were not designed to live in environments of death. This is not the original condition of humanity. And as we look at this story and we see that the demons recognize Jesus and they're fearful, they understand what Jesus is about to do. They understand what, who Jesus is. In verse 29, it says, For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times the demon had seized him, and he was keep, kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So we see that he's in graveyards where he lives. That's a place of death. And the demon drives them where? Where? To a desert, another place of death. And when you look in the Bible and you look at the wilderness, or you look at the deserts, they're often a place that are associated with death. So in the book of Exodus, when the people leave slavery, God drives them where? Into a wilderness. You say, wait, why would God bring his people to a wilderness? Why would God bring his people to a place where there's no food? Because he was teaching them, I am your source of food. He raids bread down from heaven. And watch this. He tells the people as he rains down bread from heaven, only take enough food for today. Because I'm going to do it again tomorrow. And tomorrow, only take enough food for that day because I'm going to do it again. 
And on the Sabbath day, the day where they had to rest, the day before, God gave them double. So whether they had to rest or whether they were walking around, they always had what they needed. We see that Jesus is driven into the wilderness. He's actually led there by the Holy Spirit. And Satan says, hey, I know you're hungry. Turn those stones into bread. And what does Jesus reply? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We see that in the deserts, when you're connected to God, it's a place where you see God's faithfulness. So as a side note, if you're here today and you feel like you're stuck in a wilderness, you feel like you're stuck in a desert, this is not the time to quit. This is the time to lean in and see God's faithfulness in your life. This is the desert when we're with God. This man in this story, he's driven into a desert, into a place of death. We see in Genesis, Adam is in the garden. He's placed in the garden. And this man, he's in a desert and he's in a graveyard. There's a contrast here between life and death. It's very clear this man was not in the original condition that God had designed for humanity. This man was in desperate need of recovery. This man was in desperate need of getting back to his original state. You know, it's easy to look at people who are broken and say, you need to get up. You need to do better. You need to get up and go to church. It's easy to look at people who are down and say, come on, just trust God. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Why don't you trust God? And we fail to realize that in this story, we're not Jesus. We're the madman in the graveyard. In this story, we're the ones who need help. We're so quick to judge others, but we forget that before Jesus, that's exactly who we were. We were stuck in a place of death before Jesus. We were stuck and needed help. We were bound by shackles. We were outcasts. But then Jesus shows up, and he changes everything. Say that with me. Say, when Jesus shows up, everything changes. So we look back into the story, and what I love about Jesus is once he shows up, the recovery process begins. There wasn't no formalities. Hey, how you doing, Chuck? How you doing, Jesus? I'm good. Hey, see that weather? Boy, them jets. You got to get them jets. This is our year, like the last 50 years, right? (laughs) And then all of a sudden, Jesus doesn't do all that. He jumps right in, and he commands the evil to come out of him. Jesus goes face to face with the darkest area of this man's life. He goes face to face with the most broken areas. Don't hide your brokenness from Jesus. Don't hide your brokenness from Jesus. When you're in your prayer time and there's that thing that you don't want to talk about because you're ashamed of it, that's the exact moment to talk to God about it. Number one, he's all-knowing. You can't hide stuff from God. It makes us more comfortable to not talk about it. But the reality is, when we bring the darkest areas of our life to Jesus, that is where the most recovery will take place. We see that Jesus goes face to face with the dark area of this man's life, and he speaks a word to set him free. Jesus goes face to face, and he speaks a word to set him free. I want to ask you today, if there's an area of your life that you struggle with, or an area where you feel stuck. I want to ask you, what word has God spoken that will set you free? What word has God spoken that will set you free? If the area of love is broken inside of you, if you've been hurt by life, you've been hurt by someone else, what word has God spoken that will set you free? The Bible says no greater love than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. You know who laid down his life for us? Jesus. 
So if you struggle with that feeling of love inside, there is a word that God spoke that will set you free. If you struggle with lacking joy, you feel like you have no reason to move forward, you feel down all the time, The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. God has spoken a word that can set us free. If you struggle badly with anxiety, the Bible says that when we turn to God, that there's a peace of God that surpasses even what makes sense. There is a word that is spoken that will set us free. I'm trying to illustrate something today. That whatever problem you have, there's a word that is the answer. Whatever issues you're facing, there's a word that is the answer. And that word is from Jesus. I want to ask you today, what word has God spoken that enables you to take back an area that was stolen in your life? How many of you wave at me, know that life tries to steal from us? That there's moments where life will try to steal our joy try to steal our love. We'll try to steal our faith. Maybe you're here today and you say, my innocence was stolen from me. Maybe you trusted somebody and you feel like your heart was stolen from you. Maybe you used to have trust and somebody broke that trust and you feel like trust was stolen from you. Maybe you used to have strong faith. You used to believe God for the impossible, but life has gone on. And you feel like that faith was stolen from you. I want you to understand today that the word of God has the power to bring back the things that were stolen. That the word of God turns a graveyard back into an Eden. That the word of God takes a rusty old hammer called me and restores it back to its original condition. I didn't share this at the beginning But the word recovery has two definitions. The first definition of the word recovery is to return to a normal state of mental, physical, of mental and physical health. The second definition of the word recovery is the action or process of regaining possession or control of something that was stolen or lost. The second definition of recovery is to take back something that was stolen. So if a child gets abducted and they find the child and an officer grabs the child, what do they say? We've recovered the child. One time I was working on an essay for hours and hours and I deleted it. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I jumped right online and I jumped right on Google and I was like, how to get files back that you deleted? You know what it's called? There is a system that is known as a file recovery. So although something was lost, I can get this system, and it goes in, finds what was lost, and it recovers it. If you can't see where I'm going with this, we have somebody that can take back the areas of our life that were stolen. We see in the Bible that Jesus is labeled as a second Adam. Why? In the first Adam, something was stolen. In the second Adam, it was recovered. Jesus goes in and he takes back the things that was stolen in the garden. And when we see God in this recovery process, how does he recover? He sends his word. He sends his word. You see, when Jesus spoke and when we have the Bible, we know those as the words of God But one of the titles that Jesus has is like the word of God itself. So think of if I had the words on the screen, water bottle versus this, water bottle. That is the words of God. We see the annotations of God. This is the word of God. This is the water bottle, the actual thing. So when Jesus comes down from heaven, it is God's word, God's ideas, God's thoughts, God's love literally dwelling among us. And that, believe it or not, is the place of Eden where Adam and Eve were in their right mind, recovered in their original state, walking with God. What I love about God and his word is that we see that God's word not only can 
restore us to our original condition, but that God also helps us to take back the areas that were stolen. I want you to understand today that if there's any area where you feel like you've lost and you've given up, I want to tell you two words. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, don't quit. Now turn to your backup choice and tell them, backup choice, don't quit. And if your spouse was your backup choice, don't do that. Don't do that. Put them first next time, okay? We see in the Garden of Eden that God provided everything that Adam needed. He provided all the food he needed. He had a relationship with God. We even see that everything was good in creation, but God said one thing is not good, that man has nobody to dwell with. So he even provides the one thing that Adam needed most. And we see that when God provides for us or God places us in a place that there's always the provision there. But I want to ask you, do you believe his word today? Do you believe that he has provided all that we need? This man was possessed by demons. And guess what Jesus provided? He provided him with freedom. In this story, in verse 30 to 33, Jesus, he cast the demons into a herd of pigs. And the pigs, I don't know if they, they spoke English. They looked at each other. They said, listen, bro, my life has been good, but I ain't getting stuck with no demons. And guess what these demons did? They said, see ya. They jump off of a cliff. They kill themselves when these demons go into them. And in verse 35, it says that the people went out to see what happened. And they came to Jesus and they found the man from whom the demons left, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And now they're afraid. This man used to howl all night cut himself. I'm assuming they had iron chains that this man would break. He would scream and they were fine. But the moment he got help and the moment he got healing, the people were now afraid. As a side note, if you have friends in your life that would rather see you broken than get what God has in store for you, it's time to wave bye-bye. If you're talking to a friend and you're like, you know, I'm thinking about going to the Celebrate Recovery program, and they're like, you're fine. You don't need that. You're a perfect best friend. Everybody else is the problem, not you. And they, want, they don't want to see you get help. It's time to wave them goodbye. When we look at this man in this story, we see a perfect image of the recovery process. There's a man that is in his right mind. Adam was in his right mind. He was, feel, uh, he was healed physically. Adam was perfect physically. And this man, and for me most importantly, he was sitting in the presence of Jesus. He was sitting in the presence of God. The Bible says that Adam walked with God in the garden. We see in one moment with Jesus Christ that this man is spiritually mentally and physically restored. And what I love about this story is that this man is not restored because he's able. He's restored because God is able. He's not restored because of his own discipline and his own studying of the books, which helps. This man is restored because he knew the restorer. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. When I realize I can't do it on my own, that's when I'm at my strongest because I'm relying on somebody that is greater than me. And this can be hard. A lot of times we want to do it on our own. Our pride says, look at all that I've done. When weakness says, look at all that God has done. Look at all that God has done in my life. Much like that video that we watched at the beginning, 
where there is a rusty, old, crusty, dusty hammer that lost its original condition. That was us. There was nothing that hammer could do to restore itself. There was nothing that hammer could do to fix itself. That hammer would have stayed in that condition forever. And quite honestly, it would have gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. But when that hammer was placed in the hands of a restorer, when that hammer was placed in the hand of someone that can fix it, we see that it was restored to its original condition. I want you to understand that only Jesus can restore you to your original condition today. One of the names of God is Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord, our healer, the God who heals. I want you to know that God is still healing today. We were just singing the song Waymaker, saying that God doesn't stop. I want you to understand that God still heals, that he's still restoring to our original condition. And watch what happens in verse 38. This man we see at the start of the story, he's in the graveyard. I feel that by this point of the story, he's restored this man to the original condition. And now this man asks Jesus, he says, let me follow you. Verse 38, the man from whom the demons had gone, he begged Jesus that he might be with him. He begs Jesus, say, Jesus, please let me follow you. Now think about it. He would be disciple 13. What better backstory? Like when you see a superhero in a movie and they have this huge backstory and they come all the way full circle and they set others free. What better backstory for a disciple? And guess what Jesus says to him? Nope. Verse 38 continued, but Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole entire city how much Jesus had done for him. Believe it or not, sometimes your recovery is not just for you. Sometimes your recovery will set somebody else free. There's a story in the Bible of someone, two men named Paul and Silas, and they were in prison. It says at the midnight hour that they began to praise and worship God because they were stuck. And they worshiped God in such a way that not only were their prison doors opened up, but everybody in that prison was set free because of their worship. That is the nature of recovery. I am set free that others might be set free. It's not just about us. It's about helping those who are around us. This man, he goes and he shares his testimony. And maybe you're new to church and you don't know what a testimony is. It's honestly probably better that way because testimony is not a church word. It's a legal term. When I was on jury duty and I was in a case and I was on the jury, they called a witness to the stand to share his testimony. He's saying... Based on where I was, here's what I saw. And because of what I saw, I'm announcing it to those on the jury who weren't there. So when we give our testimony, it's like we're going up on the witness stand and we're saying, here's what I saw God do in my life. And because God did it in my life, he can do it for you. That is a testimony. Charles Spurgeon, he puts it this way. The Bible is not the light of the world. It is the light of the church. But the world does not read the Bible. The world reads Christians. You are the light of the world. Sometimes when we find recovery and we find healing, we want to say, oh, I'm on to bigger and better things. Where God says, no, go back into that broken area and keep the cycle going. Go back to that broken area and begin to share your testimony. There's three points I want us to take home today as we look at this concept of recovery. Number one, recovery is a form of restoration. Recovery is a form of restoration. It does not say that Jesus shows up and he put this man into a different mind. 
it says he was back in his own right mind. Jesus doesn't give him a brand new mind. He says, I'm putting you back to the original condition. Many times when we think of recovery, we think I'm going because I want to be a brand new person. I want to be completely better. I want to tell you that the original version of you is the best version. I can go and I can buy a copy of the Mona Lisa, but it's going to be worthless. But if I got the original copy, it has tons of value. Let me ask you, would you rather be a replica or an original? You are an original. Don't look at somebody else and say, man, I wish I was a replica of them. No. Your original condition is where you ought to be. And a side note, I'm talking about the healthy version of you. I want to hear, oh, it's in my personality to knock out people and steal their wallet. No, you just act in ghetto. Like, you don't need to do that. The healthy version of ourselves. And one of the reasons why I think people might be afraid or might not want to go to recovery is so much of it is looking backwards. I don't want to talk about my past. Let's just talk about the future. I don't want to look backwards. I want to look forward. Let me ask you something. When you rewind a movie, where do you go? Backwards. When you rejuvenate something, you're saying, I'm bringing life back into this. When you restore something, you're bringing it back to its original condition. And here's one more, a Bible word. You might have heard it before. Redemption. Redeem to be bought back. We were God's possession in the garden. Something was stolen. So Jesus Christ comes down and he recovers or he redeems or he buys us back. I want to encourage us today with this. Although we cannot change the past by talking about it, we can change the power that it has over us. Although we cannot change the past by talking about it, we can change the power it has over us. Jesus doesn't send the man and say, all right, tell your story, but cut out all the bad stuff. Just talk about me. No, he says, tell your whole story. Many times people identify more with our dirt than they do our flowers. That sometimes it's the, the, the mistakes, the dirty parts that we're ashamed of that people say, you know what? I'm just like you. And if God could do it for you, he can do it for me. Number two, recovery is an action. As we saw in the second de definition, recovery is the action or the process of regaining possession or control of something that was lost. When God restores humanity, what does he do? He sends his son. He takes an action. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We talked about this in the first week, but if we want to see recovery, if we want to see this restoration, we've got to trust the process that God has given to us. And a lot of times it's sitting in small group settings like Celebrate Recovery and having conversations with other believers. And number three, recovery is a form of rest. Say that with me. Say recovery is a form of rest. Every single professional sports team, I don't care who it is, they have a recovery specialist. And the job of the recovery specialist is to say, you are burned out. We need to get you back to the original state. We need to get you back healthy. You broke a leg. All right, here's a six-month plan on how we're going to do this. You know what they do? They are very intentional about rest. They say, you need to rest. If your ankle's broken, don't try to play basketball on it. You're going to make it worse. You need to recover a form of rest. Because recovery can be uncomfortable, many times we look at it as a form of work. But I want you to know that we can rest in God and find recovery. We see this phrase with this man that appears a few times in Scripture, that he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. That phrase is not used to say, look how hard people worked to get into God's presence. It's saying, look how they are resting underneath the word of God. And maybe you're here today and you're saying, all right, I've heard about this Jesus, but I don't, need, I don't know him. 
Maybe you feel like you're a lot like that rusty hammer at the beginning, that you've lost your value, that you can't heal yourself on your own, that you can't help yourself. I want to encourage you today that Jesus Christ restores to our original condition. Now, I'm going to be honest. In that video, the man did not actually restore it to the original condition. In the last 20 seconds, you saw he added his seal on it. He put a marker that says, I'm the one that did this work. You know that when you accept Christ, that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit? That God puts a stamp and says, that's my handiwork? So if you're here today and you know, I don't have that seal, I want, we're all going to pray together. Let's pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Say, dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started 